Hi. Uh, can you see and hear me okay? Yeah, nice yeah. to meet you. Hello, good nice evening. to meet you. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. You are, you're in Bristol? Uh, I'm in Bristol in the UK. Yeah, where are you? You're in Denmark. We're in Denmark in Copenhagen in my therapy room in Copenhagen. Very nice, very nice. And, uh, and I'm Anders uh, Tingman and uh, I'm a psychologist and uh, integration therapist and then we have uh, Matthias here. Um, Hello Anders and Matthias, pleased to meet you both. And, and, and Matthias um, is, uh, is doing the uh, uh, psilocybin for alcohol dependence on the state hospital here in Denmark. So that's why we, uh, I also invited him as a guest host. Because Good. I, I yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I'm a medical doctor and a PhD student. And okay. uh, I've done clinical research in alcohol use disorder for four years. And, and uh, now we're about to start a, a study on psilocybin. Uh, Fantastic. Uh, alcohol use disorder. Yeah, so it's really exciting. And, yeah. and Great. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't know that that study was going on there in Copenhagen. That's exciting stuff. Yeah, we. I mean, we're not. We, we haven't started yet because we've waited. We've been waiting for the psilocybin to arrive for almost a year now. But uh, yeah, I'm as ready as can be. So uh, yeah, it's always the biggest delay um, getting the getting the medicine. Um, we found the same thing with our MDMA for alcoholism study. It took us about eighteen months to get the medicine. Okay. Um, so we were very delayed starting for that reason. So it seems to be quite a common thing. Yeah. yeah, it sucks. <laughs> yeah. Well, good luck. Good luck. Yeah, great. But I would just say a few words, just like a formal introduction, because uh, you know we have this uh, we have this network in Denmark, network for psychedelic therapy and medicine, and it's it's, it's quite a reason that we that we have this uh, network. We only for like a year, so I know you have been active in in the field for maybe ten years or more. 15 years or 15 years, I, yeah. I did, did my first uh, worked on the first psychedelic study here yeah. in the UK over 15 but years ago yeah as it often goes uh, we are probably a little behind in Denmark we are a small country over that but we are really trying to get a little updated here and we hope you will help us a little with that and, and well it's and, all still early days you know it's like yeah. psychedelic therapy is still in its infancy so um plenty of time to still be pioneers yeah so so and also we we of course discovered that a lot of things are going on in Norway there's a maps research center there you were going there for the conference in in May uh, I think and uh, Me too. and 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 also of course Ben uh, you you you're now a chief medical uh, uh, Executive medical officer, yeah. Officer, yeah. For for Wagen, and and we know that you you bought the Exxon Clinic up there. So 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 things are also going on in Norway. So we hope that yeah. you know, as, as we have said sometimes, we can't be sort of behind Norway. We 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 like to get things going in in the Nordic countries also, and Norway are already leading the way. So that's good to see. Excellent. And and of course, we are very excited to talk with you because. Uh, and and that that you um, are willing to to use this one hour of your evening we know you're a very busy man you are uh, engaged in a lot of projects and a lot of research and also these new clinics uh, with awaken but but um, we really want to talk to you because uh, we I, I i have found and many of us have found that you're a very interesting commentator on the psychedelic renaissance and and no wonder as you you're also with your book you're probably one who coined the term and 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 or at least popularized the term, so so you have been following this for for, for years, and and yeah. I think in some of the interviews I've seen you, you have been, uh, you have said some very interesting comments, and also on, on, on sort of the big lines, how the psychedelic renaissance also could be a psychiatric renaissance, like a new paradigm for how to yeah. use psychopharmacology and psychotherapy together. So so all these sort of how, how, how really psychologists and medical students who want to come into psychiatry, how, how should we picture what is happening right now? We thought that you're the man to, uh, to ask these questions to. And also, I must say, I was very touched. You made a, a YouTube video after you did your TED talk. You did a very passionate talk about MDMA therapy 
uh, I don't know if you remember it, but I was very moved by, by you. I could really feel your passion and your care for the, your patients also. So that was uh, very moving and, and inspiring, I think. So. Oh, well, thank you. Thank it, you. It, it certainly is my passion. Um, uh, I'm, I'm very deeply committed to this kind of work. Um, I've kind of uh, spent my, my career with, with working with psychedelics in research. And uh, now we're at this exciting stage where we're really seeing things happen in terms of uh, clinical developments beyond just research. So that's very exciting. Yeah. So, so, so maybe, maybe I should just, you know, I, we, we mailed you some, um, some questions. Maybe yep, I, I got should... those. Yep. I got those. Uh, I've got them up here in front of me. Sure. So, so, so maybe I, I should... want to do it. Yeah. Maybe I could just for, for the sake of the audience, we could just like, uh, uh, say them out aloud and then we can have a little jam around them. I don't think we can uh, go into every detail, but, but of course we, it would be nice to talk a little about uh, addiction treatments. We have uh, Matthias here who's working with psilocybin. You have been uh, studying MDMA uh, um, addiction treatment. So, so it would be very interesting to have a little discussion. You, I know you had some talks, you have said, that some of the psychedelics they really have more in common than they are different or yeah. something like that but of course there are important differences between uh, using psilocybin and mdma for addiction treatment or alcohol uh, treatment so maybe yeah. you should just start with that what what yeah. would your perspective be they have some important similarities but also differences what, what would you take yeah. on that so um i've been saying this quite a lot recently that um in my opinion, the similarities between MDMA, psilocybin and ketamine are greater than their differences in the yeah. clinical setting. Um, now, I'm, I'm triple trained as an approved MDMA, psilocybin and ketamine therapist. Um, and of course, I'm not so naive as to suggest these are all similar drugs. Anybody who's taken any of those three or all of those three would know that the subjective psychological experience of those three is very different in many ways. But when you think about the core features of clinical psychedelic therapy, the similarities are greater than the differences. Um, they all induce an altered state of consciousness to some extent. They all are delivered in a similar manner in terms of a protocol that would involve both drug and non-drug sessions um, and a mixture of those. They never just delivered the drug on their own. And the real power of the treatment comes from the non-drug sessions for preparation and integration. So all three have that same characteristic. They all tend to use the same kind of protocol with eye shades and headphones and music. And they all um, involve predominantly the patient being with the medicine um, in the silence or with the music and then doing some talk therapy around it. Where, they, where those three differ is really the amount of talk therapy that's possible or desirable um, or helpful within the acute drug experience. So for example, with ketamine, when we're using ketamine um, for the treatment of addictions, um, the patient doesn't say anything. They, they go into the ketamine experience. It lasts about 60 minutes. Um, there's no psychotherapy. The patient doesn't want to talk. They don't, they're not able to talk. They're very much in the experience. And it's not until they come down off the drug that they're able to talk. Um, it's somewhat similar with psilocybin. There's some degree of talking during the session. If the patient um, uh, starts that and wants to and brings up material, um, the therapist is likely to say, um, a few brief words and then say, go back inside with the experience, trying to encourage the patient to remain in the experience. MDMA is slightly different. Um, with MDMA, there's certainly a lot of time spent just with the drug experience, with the patient, with their eyes shut on the bed, with the headphones. But with MDMA, a little bit more so, especially because it goes on for sort of six to eight hours. Um, towards the end of the day, there's usually quite a lot of talk therapy that goes on whilst the drug is still very active. Um, MDMA, I think more so than, certainly more so than ketamine and more so than psilocybin, it's possible to have a really coherent talk discussion on MDMA. MDMA turns off the amygdala very effectively, but um, one's ability to think and reason and remember and debate 
and um, reflect, especially on childhood memories, is much enhanced in some ways with the amygdala switched off. So they do all, they have similarities, but they, and they do have differences. I think in terms of your question of, you know, which is best, um, mm. I don't really think we're able to answer that question now. Um, there's just not enough data. There's only, you know, a handful of half a dozen studies or so around the world um, that's looking at these different, these different compounds. Um, and especially given that ketamine is, is now a, is a licensed medicine, um, there's far more data on ketamine than anything else in terms of numbers of patients. Um, the other two, MDMA and psilocybin, are, are not medicines. They're research chemicals and investigational drugs. So the data is limited to the small N numbers of, of therapies, of, of research studies that have gone on. So I don't think it's possible to answer the question as to which is going to be the best. My, 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 and looking ahead at some of your earlier, uh, uh, later questions, mm. my sense for the future is that we're going to have all three and they're going to be available to all, all patients for all mental disorders, including all addictions. And so we're going to be in this fortunate position where you can sit down with the patient and say, you know, mm. would you like to, would you like to do MDMA? Would you like to do psilocybin or would you like to do ketamine? Or indeed mm. what we may see, and we haven't seen yet, but I think we will in coming years, is mixed protocols with combinations of drugs. Um, either, nobody's proposed a protocol yet where you take two different drugs in the same sitting, um, one after another, but there have been some protocols proposed with um, like MDMA one week and then two weeks later psilocybin or LSD and then two weeks later ketamine. So those kinds of protocols are starting to emerge. and. I'm, I don't like pigeonholes and categorizing. Um, I like to think that all of these different psychedelics have broadly similar characteristics when it comes to the clinical setting. And uh, hopefully they won't fit into pigeonholes whereby we say, oh, you know, ketamine is for this, MDMA is for that. They are in fact, you know, all essentially broadly adjuncts to psychotherapy. So yeah. um, they, going you know looking at some of your later questions about the future of psychiatry and and how they might be used um the way i see it is that any condition in psychiatry that responds to psychotherapy will probably respond even better to psychedelic therapy and that's and so then when we say any condition in psychiatry that's every single psychiatric indication from schizophrenia to eating disorders to personality disorders to addictions to anxiety to depression you name it all of these even even psychoses have um psychotherapy as part of their paradigms so um I, I think we're going to move to that point where where we're going to be less pigeonholing and less categorizing but be able to use these compounds more broadly as as non-specific adjuncts to psychotherapy but I, my thought is that when you also mention psychosis and, and things like that, that, that people leave aside for now because it's too risky. Uh, yeah. So, probably... so far with, you know, all of the psychedelic research studies that have happened, psychosis, personal history of um, schizophrenia or bipolar mm -hmm. one disorder tends to be a um, excluding factor. Um, it's kind of understandable um, why research ethics committees are kind of pushing for that. In reality, those of us that work in, in clinical psychiatry know very well that by far the most psychotogenic drugs out there are cannabis, amphetamine and cocaine. Those are the drugs that bring people into hospital with psychoses, not, not the psychedelics or MDMA. Um, but yeah, this early stage in research, psychosis is tended to be excluded out of research. But I'm quite sure the day will come when somebody puts forward a brave protocol to treat certain aspects of psychosis with psychedelics, I'm quite certain it'll happen. I think you, uh, some of the, the reason, that, as I understand it, you for, for using MDMA for addiction is also your background and you have very much focus on, on uh, trauma, childhood trauma, attachment issues. And, and uh, some of these things, I guess, might also lie in, in people having psychosis, but, uh, at least I've met, you know, it's, it's common to see really abused and traumatized people developing psychosis, getting schizophrenia uh, diagnosis and such. Uh, but but don't you think that MDMA might be safer uh, to, to use with the people who are prone to being psychologically unstable? Or what do you think of that? Uh, yeah, I mean, 
people who have a psychotic fragility, in other words, a genetic predisposition towards psychosis and a more likely, which is the major cause for schizophrenia, all, all sorts of things can trigger a psychotic episode. You know, a, a difficult relationship, um, alcohol, you know, um, a car accident, all sorts of things. So um, I think having a psychotic fragility in the genetics for schizophrenia um, just puts you at risk of psychosis. Um, absolutely, MDMA really stands to the fore in terms of its ability to tackle trauma. And, you know, trauma and particularly child maltreatment and abuse are absolutely at the core of almost all chronic mental disorders. Um, now, of course, there are all sorts of mental disorders that have a much more of a genetic or neurological basis like ADHD, um, for example, or schizophrenia and, and other psychoses. But when you look at the population of inpatients, for example, um, with schizophrenia, it, there's still a massive overrepresentation of people with a history of trauma. So mm. the history of trauma seems to be the most important aspect of general mental health difficulties. Mm. And we've sort of, we've known that for 75 years in psychiatry. Um, yeah. if, you, if you hurt or humiliate or abuse a child, you massively increase their risk of mental disorder, all sorts of mental disorder. And I think we have a pandemic problem in our categorization and diagnosis within psychiatry. Mm -hmm. um, my, the way I see things, having spent so long working with trauma and with psychedelics, mm -hmm. is that the, the, the end diagnosis is almost irrelevant. It's almost as if, and I like this analogy because it's a mushroom analogy, but imagine that the mycelium below is trauma mm. and the fruiting bodies, the popping up mushrooms are the different diagnoses. Now, if you disturb a child's development, they, they um, through, through some form of maltreatment or abuse, they may get an eating disorder, they may get anxiety disorder, they may get depression, they may get personality disorder, they may get PTSD. You know, it's almost irrelevant what the little diagnosis is that pops its head up over the top. Um, yeah. And one of the problems of biological psychiatry and categorization um, over the last 40 or 50 years is that we end up just treating this core symptom-based um, presentation and forgetting that, 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 that trauma below. Um, now, I know that sounds very naive. Um, and of course, we have to have diagnoses and we have to have categories and mental disorders are not random. They do present in clusters of symptoms that, that we call different diagnoses. But trauma just seems to be so important at the root cause of all of it, which for me is really what shines the spotlight on psychedelics um, and particularly MDMA as, as a really useful tool. But uh, given what you've just said, I mean, uh, I mean, if trauma underlies almost all the psychiatric diseases, then uh, one would think that MDMA should be the most effective one uh, compared to psilocybin or ketamine, right? In um, treatment of, uh, if, 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 if trauma is the real uh, underlying cause of, let's yeah. say, addiction, yeah. then um, it should be more effective than psilocybin. I, it, it's kind of interesting, isn't it? I mean, what I like about MDMA is it's very, it's very um, tolerable and clinically deliverable. Um, you know, as, as we all know, there's a reason why in the UK, 750,000 kids take ecstasy every weekend um, compared to a tiny number that take mushrooms or LSD. Um, it's, it's, it's much more manageable. It's, it's, it's an invariably pleasant experience. It's like it's like taking an opiate. You don't really have a bad trip on MDMA. It's very unusual. Um, it, it sort of guarantees a positively felt affect MDMA if it works. Um, whereas the, the classic psychedelics, um, LSD and psilocybin, they require a great deal more care and attention as a therapist. Um, you know, as Aldous Huxley said, is heaven or hell. Um, you can go either way. And so now that doesn't mean that the classic psychedelics are not immensely useful, but they're certainly trickier clinically to manage. And there's more patients who, are, who would not tolerate them. Indeed, there's many patients who wouldn't even tolerate the idea of them. Um, which is why ecstasy is so much more popular than LSD. You know, we've had LSD's been around for 75 years. Um, way more people take ecstasy um, than, than have ever taken LSD. So there's, there's a reason that, you know, classical psychedelics 
can be tricky and can be difficult. Um, and that's reflected in, in, in the pattern of recreational use. Now, I'm not saying that, they're, that classic psychedelics are not really useful as well. Um, and when, when the experience is done well, with really careful guiding and preparation and integration, the, the transformative, um, mind-blowing, if you like, effect of a classic psychedelic experience is, is profound and can really radically shift a person's um, direction. Um, really because underlying all mental disorders, again, uh, as well as trauma, is this sense of rigidity and stuckness. Um, and, you know, as a child psychiatrist, you know, I always go back to attachment and the blueprint for our mental psyche, which is formed by those very early crucial years. It's, it's during those early crucial years that we lay down the foundations of what is love, what is trust. Is it okay to steal? Is it okay to hit people? Is it okay to drop litter? Is it okay to lie? You know, you learn those things when you're like that tall and you never, let, you never lose them. You keep them your whole life, those core fundamental parts of self. And that's one of the problems with mental disorder. It's about the stuckness because once you've learned that you are a useless, worthless, unlovable, unloved, horrible, mean person, you kind of, it's hard to unlearn that when you've been told that since you were one foot tall. Um, it's a bit like someone coming along to me now. Um, I have, I've had a good attachment and a good childhood and saying, you know what, Ben, actually you're a really horrible person. Nobody likes you. Um, everyone's lying to you. You mustn't trust anyone. Um, you've got to lie and cheat and steal because that's how to get through life. Now, if someone came and told me that now, I just, I wouldn't believe them because it just, it doesn't fit in with my, my experience of life. So similarly, why would my patients believe me when I try and tell them otherwise? When I try and say, look, it's not your fault. You were abused. Um, life is not as bad as you think. Actually, most people everywhere are really nice. Most people are. You know, the world is a very benign place, despite what we see from the media. Almost everyone everywhere is really, really nice to one another all over the world. Um, they really are. Society just wouldn't work if we weren't. Um, society is not held together by some police state. It's held together by people with positive attachments wanting to be nice to one another. And so, yet if your experience of childhood is so disordered, you don't see that. Now, you can talk to a patient all day and they're not going to see that. But what the beauty of psychedelics is they actually it's not, it's, it's above just talk therapy. They actually get a physical living experience of a different way of thinking. Yeah. And that's what's so vital to shifting that stuckness and rigidity that underlies so many mental disorders and especially addictions. But, but don't you think MDMA, uh, this thing about self-acceptance and, and maybe positive attachment, don't they have a, like a MDMA, a, a special role there or they, with the release of oxytocin and it seems like this feeling of self-acceptance and, and positive uh, attachments is, is very profound or very available in MDMA. It can, it can of course also experience it with psilocybin but uh, MDMA seems to promote yeah. that a lot. It, it is it, it's the switching off of the amygdala and yeah. what, what MDMA does so well is it switches off the amygdala so selectively. Many drugs switch off the amygdala, the fear complex, um, a bag of heroin turns off the amygdala very well. A bottle of vodka turns off the amygdala really well, which is why these are you know, very popular drugs in people with trauma. You just want to turn off that pain. But those drugs are messy. Um, they don't just turn off the fear. They turn off all the cognition as well. MDMA is so beautifully pharmacologically unique that it just so cleanly turns off the fear. But you can still talk and reason and remember. Um, it's, quite, it's quite amazing the way it does this. Um, and when, when a patient's lived their whole life in, in a state of fear, um, since, since the day they were born, they, it's, it's incredible revelation for them when they experience MDMA and they're able to talk about this thing, because by the time you're in your thirties, forties, fifties, you've become an absolute expert at not talking about that night when you were 10 years old. You'll do anything but talk about that night. You've become so expert at avoiding it that you self-harm or use drugs, um, particularly alcohol and heroin and these drugs to, to not go there. And with the fear switched off, it's, it's remarkable seeing the look on a patient's face 
Um, and this is, you know, this is why there's such high treatment resistance in PTSD, 60% treatment resistance, such high treatment resistance in addictions, 90% treatment resistance in alcoholism. You know, it's because you can only go so far in talking about your therapy, then you hit this brick wall where you go, I'm not going there. And you go and you drop out and you go back to the vodka. And it's amazing. You ask the patients on the MDMA, can you tell me about that night when you were 10 years old? And they're like, wow, I can. Yes, yeah. I can tell you all about it. And they're even amazed at their own ability to do it um, because the fear is turned off. And that's a very unusual characteristic in, in yeah. pharmacology. But, um, but MD may also have this, of course, maybe it's connected to the oxytocin release, you, you know, yeah. we call it an intactogen. So, so there's also this sense of wanting to get in touch with each other, touching the other, both physically, but also feeling close, the closeness aspect yeah. of uh, just thinking if you have uh, attachment wounds, that must be very healing. And also maybe also for if you have psychosis, uh, you can also describe that as being out of touch with your reality because you are not uh, in touch with, uh, with your social reality or with other people. Yeah, uh, yeah what, absolutely. What it's this, that's, that's the sort of the sense of empathy um, yeah. and the increase in theory of mind, which is why it's been, it, there, there's a lot of people interested in M MDMA for autism and an aspect of autism. Um, yeah. It's this ability to, you know, I, 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 I saw a patient on MDMA and she was saying, um, she said, I can't, I can't forgive what my father did to me as a child. I can't condone what he did, but he must have been in a really bad place to do that to his six-year-old daughter. Now, what an amazing statement of empathy that is. You could be in therapy for 20 years and not say something like that. And that's because this, as exactly as you describe, Anders, this capacity to um, engage with the thoughts of someone else and put yourself in their shoes. It's quite remarkable the way MDMA does that. So you both have empathy for your assailant or attacker. You also have empathy for yourself. You have a sense of self-love and you have a experience of, of self-love, perhaps for the first time. I had a patient on MDMA say to me, she was sitting there and she, she looked up and she said, Ben, um, is this what love feels like? Is this what love is like? And I sort of stopped and thought for a second. I thought, well, you know, this is a, artificial synthetic drug induced experience of course this isn't love you know this is this is just a drug love is something much grander than this but then i stopped before i answered and i thought to myself i thought look here's a woman who her entire life has felt nothing but pain and misery and exclusion mm -hmm. and fear and now right now for these few precious hours she's feeling safe warm contained trusted held and i went yeah you're right. This is what love feels like. This is how it is. And she was like, wow, that's amazing. She says, I've never had this feeling ever. And she says, and she said to me, Ben, do you have this feeling like all the time anyway? And I went, I went, yeah, when I'm with my friends and my family, this is how it is. And she goes, my God, I've never had this. Now, the cynics would say, you know, well, it's just a drug induced experience. But, you know, to some, for someone who's never even experienced that mental state, that's a very, very important platform. So she can now go forward out without the MDMA, knowing what that is like, knowing she didn't even know what to aim for when she were thought, talked of love. Mm -hmm. So yeah, inducing that, that positively felt mood um, is very valuable, even though it is an artificial drug experience. It's a very valuable drug experience that allows a patient to begin their healing journey towards yeah. what it is they're looking for. Yeah, it's a beautiful thing that people that we are able to maybe provide people a, a safe space, a therapeutic safe space where they can uh, experience love and care maybe for the first time in their life if they come from really uh, maltreatment and, and trauma. But uh, I, I just want uh, to jump a little ahead to one of the other questions. We have one of the questions that 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 uh, goes uh, with the vocabulary we should use on, on these uh, psychedelic experiences. Uh, because you have said some uh, in, in in a talk I heard with you, uh, you you said we 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 should clean out some of this uh, kind of uh, new age hippie kind of language uh, because uh, you know people come from all over uh, from working class background and they don't want all this uh, new age language. But and then you said in this talk, uh, so talking about 
you know, the opening of the heart chakra and all this new age mm -hmm. thing. Uh, it's, uh, we shouldn't use that kind of vocabulary, but but a lot of people talk about this experience of love actually as a, as a heart opening experience. Yeah. So, so, so how can we describe that in a clinical yeah. language without reducing the phenomena here? I mean, I think, I think first thing I say is I would never say we shouldn't or should do one thing or the other. No. I think, you know, we need to be broad minded and, and, and hear, all the, hear all the points of view. I think the point I was making there was that um, my, my goal is to increase accessibility to psychedelics. Mm. Um, you know, this psychedelics have been around for 75 years. We've had MDMA for 35 years. And um, there's quite a dogmatic and rigid stereotypical psychedelic culture that in my opinion is a barrier to, 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 ac mm. to accessibility for many people. Um, there's a whole subculture of new ageism and that kind of thing, which, which scares off a lot of people. And a lot of people are just do not speak that language. Um, so we need to find a language that meets the patient where they are rather mm. than expecting the patient to subscribe to a preconceived agenda. So, um, you know, and I remember saying this in a talk, why do we always have pictures of like the Buddha on the wall and burning incense and sitar mm. music? Why not a picture of Manchester United or Beyonce? You know, mm. if that is our patient's power objects, we should be meeting them where they are, not expecting them to come to us and to adopt some stereotypical um, subculture um, because it's all about accessibility. Um, and I think there is a bit of a conflict and you know, you, you touch on this on some of your other questions. There is a bit of a conflict with the so-called psychedelic community, whatever they are. Um, and uh, I don't think there's any need for conflict because it's not a competition. Um, I think if we all, if, if, if these are magic medicines and if these are so important, they should be accessible and we need to make them accessible. Um, someone at a conference recently said to me, do I worry about the over-medicalization of psychedelics? I worry about the under-medicalization of psychedelics. You know, psychedelics have been around a long time and they are perfectly accessible for non-medical use if people want to use them like that. But if we really want to get the many, many hundreds of thousands of millions of people who could benefit from them, we need to um, bring them into the system so that they can work within the system. And that is um, a very boring job. It's all about data and Excel spreadsheets yeah. and graphs and research grants and ethics committees. That's how the system works. Now we can push against that and say, hey man, get your hands off my sacred molecules. And we can say that and they will remain sacredly illegal forever. Um, but, but, or, but guess... or, we, or, we, or we adopt the system in order to get them into the into the hospitals and the clinics where people can access them, and and that's and that's a process of science. Sure, but 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 of course there are also some limitations of the clinical or medical language that we use. Maybe if people have a heart opening experience on MDMA, or maybe uh, Matthias is doing a psilocybin treatment, and people have a spiritual experience, and they are going to interpret that in some kind of framework, maybe. A new age, maybe a spiritual, maybe a religious framework, and 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 is it really possible to have a like a neutral framework, or or or, or how how should we manage that? It's, it's not really we, maybe we, an easy easy question. Is it? No, it's, yeah. it's especially true for the classic psychedelics, right? That yeah. you have extraordinary experiences of spirituality or mystical, yeah. Yeah. and, and how do you put that into an ordinary life, right? Yeah, I mean, the simple answer is we let the patients lead us in that direction. We, we, don't, we don't tell them, we certainly don't give them a dogmatic view about spirituality mm. and psychedelic spirituality, which psychedelic spirituality is such a bizarre term, if you ask me. It's probably the least spiritual way of being spiritual. You've just taken a psychedelic drug, for God's sake. Of course you feel spiritual. Um, give, me a, give me a spiritual experience without a psychedelic drug and I'm much more convinced by it. Um, of course you're gonna have one on a psychedelic drug. That's what they do. Um, so we let the patients lead us, and we certainly don't use a dogmatic term. And and I certainly wouldn't science out a patient who's having a spiritual experience. You're, you, I mean, you're, you're quite right. They they are an extraordinary, non ordinary experience. What and what interests me most is what do we do with that clinically? 
And the, what we do is we, we use that to tackle the rigidity of their stuckness. Now, if they want to call it God or Buddha or chakra or energy levels or whatever they want to call it, that's absolutely fine. It's their language. It's their experience. The point mm -hmm. is, how do we use this to shift you from your stuckness mm -hmm. into function? And I think this is why function, functionality, should be the leading outcome for all um, psychiatric research, not just psychedelics. Um, you know, I was saying this to a patient today, you know, I said to him, you know, I'm not going to be doing this work with you just to turn you into a highly enlightened, lonely man. You know, I, we're doing this not to fix your head, but to fix your life. Mm -hmm. So I don't just want to see cognitive change. I want to see you getting a girlfriend, getting a job, staying out of prison, you know, real functional social change. These should be our endpoints and our outcomes and our goals. And so whatever language we use to get there, that's, that's, what, that's up to the patient. The most important thing is the shift in their lifestyle, because that's what brings them to the doctor. They don't come to the, to, to the clinic complaining of cognitive problems. They usually come to the clinic because they've lost their job or they've lost their partner and they can't see their children. And that's that these are real social things. This is why social workers are so vital to, 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 to health teams. Um, social workers, occupational therapists, people who work on the grounds with on the ground with people making functional change, much more important than doctors writing prescriptions. But 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 still, don't you think that that people, patients will still be looking to the experts for some kind of language and, and still there are different languages already. John Hopkins are using a more religious language, mystical experience, uh, and maybe also the people from MAPS are using the transpersonal psychology. Uh, there are all, already different MAPS or different yeah. discourses around what are these experiences. And, and, yeah. and, and of course, it's a good uh, strategy to, to keep it client-centered and on their language, but can we avoid them looking to us for some kind of language? And, no, and, and, and um, if we don't provide them, won't they just go to the internet and get all kinds of interpretive language itself on the psychedelic? Why, why should they do that? that's what works for them um the other thing is that can you still hear me i don't know if you can still hear me but um, no there's a there's a small oh, no, we're, back. we're back we're back um yeah um the thing about well so yeah johns hopkins were pretty clever they didn't say mystical they said mystical type experience okay yeah mystical type yeah so, 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 so they were they were well aware of that you know yeah. i I, I take your point that the patients will look to experts, but maybe experts should reply with, well, what works for you? Sure. Maybe that maybe that's the most expert re but, reply. But, but some people will will, you know, mm, feel like the, the doctor or the psychologist is some kind of is, maybe have in, initiated them in a sort of sacred experience or something like that. They are the the the, the gatekeepers of something special, right? So the, uh, I'm just wondering, you know, whether we like it or not, uh, we are standing in, 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 in a situation where we can be perceived as sign of the, the, the gatekeepers to, to uh, be able to people to experience some kind of the mystery of existence or something like that. And they will, will look to, yeah, some, some, yeah. some language. Well, you know, I think, I think individual clinicians need to make their own decisions on how they how, how they use that sort of language. Um, I, 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 as I said, I'm not, I'm not keen on categorizations because um, I don't like anyone else's categorizations of me. So I don't see why they should listen to anything of mine. I, I just want one question, uh, Ben, uh, connected to uh, Matthias's work also. Uh, when, when we talk about MDMA uh, for addiction treatment, uh, there seems to be a lot of focus on treating uh, attachment wounds, uh, trauma, and when we talk about using psilocybin for alcohol and treatment, there's more uh, focus on, on having some kind of mystical type experience or, or maybe a sense of meaning or uh, a new outlook of life or a new existential uh, kind of uh, yeah, way, yeah. Of a new perspective. 
would would you think that that um, they they work on uh, addiction in, in different dimensions or is it just the language we're using right now or? i think it's just the language we're using i think another point here that's really interesting that came up with our mdma study mm -hmm. um we we saw mdma behaving a lot more like a classic psychedelic than we expected okay. we had we weren't just working on index trauma events under with mdma we had a lot of patients who had mind-blowing peak experiences people who saw the light who had transformational moments in, in with this mdma experience because because of this fear reduction for the first time in their life that that caused a major shift so and i i my, my own personal theory on this is goes back to confounding issues around ecstasy use versus other recreational use look at the way people take ecstasy Mm -hmm. It's an externalizing drug. You take it with a rave of 5,000 people, loud music, lasers, banging, banging sounds, big parties. Look at the way people take mushrooms recreationally. Four or five people sitting around a quiet candle listening to Pink Floyd. It's much closer to how we use it clinically. So what's really interesting about that, the way we use classic psychedelics clinically is really close to how we use them recreationally. But the way we use MDMA clinically is very different from how we use ecstasy recreationally. My, my theory here is imagine a rave with 5,000 people lying on their backs in the dark with eye shades and headphones on. I think you would get an awful lot more in the way of reports of mystical experiences. So I think part of the reason that we're slipping into these pigeonholes, I mean, I'm not for a moment suggesting that MDMA causes as many spontaneous spiritual experiences as, as, as psilocybin, because I think the Johns Hopkins work is pretty, pretty clear on that. But I do think that there's far more psychospiritual um, potential with MDMA than we give it credit for, because we're looking at ecstasy users and raves. Um, and when we use it in the clinical setting with the eye shades and the headphones, it really does behave not unlike psilocybin in many cases. Great. And, and would, would you, I have asked Ben a few questions. Do we have one, uh, uh, And also Ben, uh, is it right that you are open for little questions for other people? Yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I've been looking at some of the questions, um, but... Um, I, I, just want... I can't understand them if they're not in English, but you oh, might, no. you'll have to translate them for yeah. me. Yeah, but uh... I'm just Ben, I'm, I'm interested to hear uh, what what are your thoughts about the addictive potential of MDMA? I know it's mild, right? But we we work with uh, people who are addicted to alcohol, yeah. maybe or, or, or other substances, and 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 uh, if you don't know anything about psychedelics or MDMA, you would think that it's a stupid idea to give MDMA as a treatment to a person yeah. who is addicted to something. Right? Yeah, um, you would think that if you didn't know anything about psychopharmacology or addictions. Um, mm. So there are three good reasons why MDMA, well, MDMA has very, very low addictive um, uh, yeah. qualities. And there's three bits of evidence for this. Firstly, um, animal studies with MDMA, you don't get patient, you don't get animals self-dosing repeatedly with MDMA like they do with drugs like benzodiazepines, alcohol, opiates, cocaine. Second bit of evidence is the epidemiology of recreational ecstasy use. Um, we do not have our wards and clinics and addiction services full of ecstasy users. E addiction to ecstasy is, it's just doesn't happen. You don't get people breaking into your house to steal your television to buy their next ecstasy tablet. It, you don't get this drug seeking behavior. We'd know about it by now after 35 years of heavy ecstasy use if MDMA was, was gonna try, show itself as a drug with physical dependence potential and um, withdrawal symptoms and those kinds of aspects. Um, and the third bit of evidence is the, the last 20 years of MDMA research. Nobody has gone out and become um, addicted to ecstasy um, as a result of clinical MDMA. So, um, and that goes, the other psychedelics even less so, um, yeah. even less so psilocybin and LSD. So um, all of the psychedelics have very low addiction potential. So that argument about giving MDMA to, to addicts, you know, there is very little worse you can do for yourself than drink a bottle of vodka a day. There is no medical intervention out there that's worse than a bottle of vodka a day. So if taking MDMA two or three times in a clinical setting stops that, it's absolutely justified. Um, and there's no, there's just no data argument whatsoever that giving MDMA 
can risk MDMA addiction and that that would be worse than alcoholism. So um, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's very safe in that respect. Great. There, there are so many things we'd like to discuss with you, but the time is running really fast. So I think I have a few questions and maybe uh, in, a, in, a, in a five minutes, maybe we should allow other people to ask some questions. But just one question, uh, uh, what do you think of ketamine? Do you think it uh, primarily as a, like a, a stepping stone or do you think it will really have a place in the future psychedelic clinics? You, I know in Awaken, you, you start using ketamine and then you uh, will uh, work with MDMA and psilocybin when it yeah. is possible. So, you know, when I started working with ketamine, I, at first, before, well, before we started working with it, I considered it not my favorite psychedelic at all. Um, and I, I was really keen to, to be using MDMA and psilocybin as soon as possible. Um, but actually, I'm, I'm really, really enjoying working with ketamine. I think it's actually really, really beneficial. It's, um, it goes very well with um, psychotherapy that, that is seeking to allow a person to separate their, their pain and their fear or their, their depression or their trauma from their healthy self. It, the dissociative effect in combination with psychotherapy is very powerful. I think ketamine psychotherapy is... Um, it's not just a sort of poor cousin of the others. I do think mm. in combination with psychotherapy, I do think it's powerful. The problem is that if you look at what are so-called ketamine clinics all over the world, um, mm. that very few of them, less than 1% of them are, are combining it with psychotherapy. They're just using ketamine as an antidepressant and they just pump as much ketamine into you as they can as an antidepressant. Mm. They consider the psychedelic aspect to be a irritating side effect. Um, and I've seen some clinics where they say, you know, we're going to infuse you with ketamine. You're going to feel a bit weird for a couple of hours. Sorry about that. Don't worry. It'll soon pass. And then the nice antidepressant effect will start. I yeah. think that they're, they're missing something there. It's not an irritating side effect. It's a really valuable mental state in combination with psychotherapy. Um, it really does allow patients to address um, this rigidity issue again, this stuckness. Um, and also biologically, the way ketamine works in terms of neurogenesis, um, dendrite growth, um, this provides this platform for neuroflexibility um, and neuroplasticity, which in combination with the psychotherapy, when you're asking the patient to look for new ways of thinking, new paradigms, new narratives, um, is very powerful indeed. So I think ketamine is, uh, it's surprised me um, in, in, in my use with it recently. So, very interesting. Because I, I, I maybe thought of it as maybe just a stepping stone and maybe it wouldn't be that interesting in the long run, but a very interesting input. I think it is. And yeah. so, you know, and yeah, you're right. So at, at Awaken Life Sciences, at the clinics, um, you know, we're a biotech company. So we're, we're both developing and researching medicines, psychedelic medicines, but we're also delivering them with this network of clinics. And just mm -hmm. jumping ahead to some of your other questions, you say, what's with the vision behind Awaken and the plans for Europe? So yeah, we got one clinic open in Bristol, um, mm -hmm. clinic in London opening in the next few months, um, mm -hmm. then a clinic in Manchester. We have a clinic open in Oslo with a second clinic in um, Norway coming soon. And with plans, we have a specific um, medical officer based in Oslo who is um, responsible for rolling out further Nordic developments of, of Awaken Clinics. So yeah. we envisage um, the Nordic countries to be a really important part of the future of psychedelic medicine within Europe. Um, and with one clinic open in, in, in Oslo so far, which I visited recently. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, I think the Nordic countries have always been very open to psychedelics. I, I spoke, uh, uh, I've spoken twice in Iceland, a um, mm. couple of times in, in Norway um, over the last 10 years. So there is, there is a, a, a very rich culture um, of psychedelic therapy and um, within, within the Nordic countries. And I'm really excited about that. So uh, we'll probably see a, a clinic in Copenhagen in the next few years. Well, I hope so. And it would be nice yeah. if, if Awaken can be behind that. So yeah. do stay in touch about that. Um, you know, if you if you have the doctors and the nurses and the psychotherapists and um, the building, um, we can talk about how to develop that. Yeah, that would be interesting too, because, yeah, 
That would be great. And like you said, it's, um, it's sort of ketamine now, MDMA mm -hmm. and psilocybin coming soon. But what we really want to do, you see, is mm -hmm. to establish ourselves as, we're not calling ourselves a ketamine clinic. We're calling ourselves a psychedelic medical clinic. Yeah. And it's just ketamine is the only drug that's currently licensed. The others we're, we're researching, we're doing research with MDMA, um, but they can only be used in research protocols, not as treatments. Great. And, and before we move to the other questions, Ben, it would be great if you could just say a little to uh, some of the medical students and the future psychiatrists that are listening on this call. Uh, what, 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 how do you see the, the, how would it be fair to talk about the limits of our current, current approach, maybe uh, a little too much dampening symptoms and what, what really yeah. is the interest of the new paradigm and why should you be excited? How, how can we inspire new psychiatrists to, to see yeah. this? Is, maybe well, there's something great happening here. Absolutely, you should be inspired. Um, I remember when I was in at, at Oxford 15 years ago, um, when I started showing an interest in this, one of my tutors took me aside and he said to me, Ben, why are you, why are you looking at these crazy hippie drugs? Um, this is career suicide. Why don't you study something nice and you know wholesome like SSRIs or antipsychotics? <laughs> yeah. now, um, far from career suicide, you know, far from it. Um, this is a this is not some crazy fringe subject anymore. So for those medical students and trainee psychiatrists out there, this is not just some fringe subject. I mean, look look at it, NYU, UCL, UCLA, Cardiff, Bristol, Imperial, Yale, Harvard, Oxford, Cambridge, John Hopkins. These are not fringe centers. These are centers of neuropsychiatric research. And all of these places have active psychedelic research programs now. This is at the forefront, at the cutting edge of developmental psychiatry. Um, it's not a crazy fringe subject. It, it really is gonna be an important part of the future of psychiatry. And, and going to your question of you know, the, the current situation, one of the things that drives me is the lack of efficacy of current treatments where we treat the symptoms. We, we treat the overlying symptoms. If they're depressed, we give them an antidepressant. If they can't sleep, we give them a hypnotic. If their mood goes up and down, we give them a mood stabilizer. If, they're, if their hypervigilance becomes paranoid, we give them an antipsychotic. Four different classes of drugs there, none of which are curing the patient. All of them are treating the overlying symptoms. It's like treating the fever associated with an infection, but not giving an antibiotic to kill the bug. Um, and so it's like taking paracetamol or ibuprofen for an infection, but not an antibiotic. So this goes back to the earlier discussion about psychiatric diagnoses and categories. Um, we're missing the wood for the trees in not treating the underlying issues. And what psychedelic therapies do so well is they, they, they just cut through that, that top presentation, that superficial presentation, whether it's an eating disorder or a personality disorder or an addiction or an anxiety disorder, they and get right to the heart of what, why the patient is presenting at all. And it almost always goes back to some form of early trauma. And psychedelics are the antibiotic in that respect. Um, they're what we've been waiting for in psychiatry for the last hundred years. Um, they're what are, is going to change um, this top-down purely biological model into a much more holistic model where we're going to focus on patients and patients are going to write their own care plans in a bespoke way. And we're going to use these medicines alongside social inputs and psychological inputs and occupational therapies. Um, you know, the, you, ha you have to forgive me that I get so excited when I talk about this because I'm really I, not, I I'm, really, I'm really not some crazy messianic type person. I'm a scientist. I'm a very boring, sober scientist, but I am fascinated by this subject because it works. It mm. works, it's safe, and it's effective. Mm. And I'm seeing again and again, the data of patients who've been stuck in traditional biological models for decades, and they're having breakthrough experiences with psychedelics. It's too big to ignore the data. So Come at it from a psycho-spiritual side if you want. Come at it from a, from a scientific data side if you want. It works. And, it, and so to the young people here in the audience, put yourself behind this. It's still early days. You're still going to be a pioneer in the field, even if you start now. Um, it's still only small. You know, to, it's, we need to get the message out there. And we need to do more research. And we need to get more approvals. And we need to shift this because 
mental illness does not have to be a chronic problem, a lifelong problem. Do you know what? I don't want to be a psychiatrist. I want to be an orthopedic surgeon. I, I want to get someone in, mend their broken ankle, discharge them and never have to see their face again. That's what orthopedic surgeons do. Why don't we do that in psychiatry? We don't believe we can. We, we, we behave as if we're palliative care doctors. We just get alongside people for life. And if you go to your psychiatrist in your 20s with PTSD, you're probably going to be seeing them in your 60s or 70s. That is not good enough. That's appalling no. after 100 years of modern psychiatry. And it's because we're not focusing on the underlying issues. Um, so I hope he's not dropped out again. Uh, yeah, it's, it is an exciting time. And I do encourage people to get involved. And hopefully you can hear me. Maybe, uh, oh, hi. And, uh, hello, my name is Martin. I'm the chairman of the Psychedelic Society of Denmark. So, um, hello, Martin. Yes, I, I guess I'm representing the, the psychedelic community. And uh, yeah, like I would love to talk about that, of course. Uh, we do have some questions that I'll relay. Um, we have one question from the Facebook chat from one Luis who asked, uh, Can you get addicted to be free from your fear? Uh, it could be, uh, can people be a bit tired of life with fear and long for the experiences of MDMA? Or is there a way to prolong the reduced fear into everyday life and experiences? And I guess that's exactly what you're talking about. Uh, I suppose that, that that's the, the art form, but uh, yeah. yeah what would I, mean, you I, think, I think the important thing about the psychedelic experience is you can't stay high forever, you know? You, you, you do the psychedelic therapy to have transformative breakthrough experiences. Um, and then you use that for meaningful lifestyle change. Um, you don't have to keep repeating it. it. This is, you know, this is the antithesis of, of this maintenance daily prescribing. Um, the reason I like psychedelic drug therapy is because I don't like the idea of patients taking drugs every day just to gently tweak symptoms. Better to have a proper breakthrough experience that's transformative, and then they don't need to sit on these drugs like SSRIs for the rest of their lives, nor do they need to keep repeating psychedelic experiences frequently. Hmm. We have a question from the chat. Um, the, the, the question is, there's a Danish underground, I suppose, provider of psychedelic journeys who seem, apparently claims that uh, one journey is equivalent to 10 years of, 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 of therapy. And I've heard uh, variations on, on that theme. Um, what's your, your take on that? Well, it's a, it's a snappy thing to say, isn't it? It sounds good. Um, I don't know how you would go about quantifying that one psychedelic journey is the same as 10 years of uh, of a, of a non-psychedelic therapy. Um, one kilo shulgin. Yeah, one kilo shulgin. But, you know, as I said right earlier, we're certainly seeing really important breakthrough experiences with psychedelics that are moving people on who have been stuck for many, many years in, in traditional treatments. So how you quantify that, I don't know, but it certainly appears to be a big shift, um, a big paradigm shift, um, and we should take notice of it. Mm. Uh, so personally, I'm a somatic therapist, and um, I'm, we're talking about psychotherapy here as an integral part. Is there other, other this is a loaded leading question, I'm, I apologize, but uh, are there other modalities of therapy that you see engaged with psychedelics, uh, particularly I'm interested in somatic therapy and also yeah. the uh, between ketamine, MDMA and so forth? Yeah, I mean, I'm one of these kinds of therapists that would be what you, a psychologist might call an eclectic therapist. Um, I don't like to be pigeonholed into I'm a this sort of therapist or that sort of therapist. I think there are aspects of all kinds of therapy. Sometimes when, um, people would ask me, what, what model of psychotherapy did you use in your MDMA study for alcoholism? And my very um, uh, cheap answer is we used MDMA assisted psychotherapy for the treatment of alcohol alcoholism therapy and we made it up and we're going to keep making it up and we're going to keep working on it it doesn't fit nicely into other into there's aspects of transpersonal there's aspects of motivational enhancement therapy there's aspects of CBT there's aspects of psychoanalysis um you know it's let, let's let's move away from these categories. Let's see what the patient wants to drive us towards. 
Mm. So we are at about, uh, it's now 22 by our clock. Uh, and uh, if you're open for a few more questions, you have Yeah, time. I mean, I can we see can a continue. few in the chat. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So that... Yeah. There's one from Jesper Tobias Andreasen. Uh, could yeah. we maybe we could allow him to uh, sure. to, to ask the question, Martin, if you could uh, unmute him. Um, he the question he asks in the chat is um, the issue of silencing the amygdala while maintaining cognitive capacity. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Hello. Hi. Yes. Hello, Ben. Hello. Hi. Very nice talk. Thank you for a great talk, Ben. Oh, thank you. Thank you for listening. Pleasure to hear. It. Um, so I also teach uh, neuropsychopharmacology and, and have a project on psychedelic research and, and DMA. And um, some of the discussions we sometimes have is the silencing of the amygdala during the MDMA experience and, <clears throat> and how that frees up capacity to, to deal with the underlying problems because the cognition is still maintained. But yeah. at the same time, we recommend against using benzodiazepines during psychotherapy for trauma because of the, with the argument not so, so much being that it blunts the cognitive function, but, but the fact that it also inhibits the amygdala so that it, the amygdala does not sufficiently react to the trauma and restructure the experience or re, uh, reappraise the experience. And so I've been sort of, confused about why is what is that makes MDMA so unique mm. in this sense why can't if, why can't benzodiazepines do the same thing yeah um it, it's a really good question and you probably know the answer better than I do um yes but if you know if this is your field of, of neuropsychiatry um but it does do this um the cognitive the cognitive capacity appears to be very well maintained. There's some degree of cognitive um, impairment, of course, you know, you, th there's no doubt that a person on a high dose MDMA experience, you know, has poorer um, hand eye coordination and uh, will stumble on their words and all these kinds of things there. But it's not as reduced as it is with other drugs such as opiates and benzodiazepines, but the amygdala is so effectively switched off. But I think you also mentioned this interesting thing about the importance of feeling negative affect as a healing capacity, as part of the healing process. Now, I remember this argument years ago, 10, 10 years ago, talking um, with the psychology community about this. I think that the PTSD psychology community have moved on a bit. There was this stage where you sort of, it was felt that trauma focused therapy should be hard. It must be difficult. The patient must feel some pain so we can work on it. I think MDMA has taught us that actually feeling love and warmth and tenderness and peace and serenity are just as powerful. The patient, I mean, for goodness sake, the patient feels enough pain. They're feeling it all the time every day. Um, and these few hours in a pain-free state um, are actually very, very valuable. So I think that the psychology community has moved on somewhat that, that, we're, that in order to treat trauma, you've got to, you've got to scare them a bit because then they got something to work on. I, I don't think that that, that that rings true. And I think MDMA has shown us that that doesn't ring true. And an equally that that you, experience is a positive experience. Does that mean that you disagree with the recommendation against using benzodiazepines? Because although it, they don't, cause the same level of uh, feeling connected and attachment to others. Uh, they still calm the emotions. So yeah, you, um, do you think with the, with the more modern uh, psycholo psychological approach, do you think it's, it should actually be advised, if not MDMA, then to use benzodiazepines during therapy? Um, I've not, I have no clinical experience of using benzodiazepines specifically as an adjunct to psychotherapy. It's not, it's not a common thing in my experience, certainly not in the UK. Um, I mean, of course, a lot of patients with trauma have are on benzodiazepines or using them as rescue medication and that kind of thing. And when a patient is having an extreme anxiety um, panic attack, there's, a, there's definitely a place for benzodiazepines um, because they do take that edge off the high level physical anxiety, particularly, and then that allows the patient to engage with the process. So I'm not against that as an idea, um, but I think MDMA would be more effective because it does all of that, plus this, um, this uh, very positive affect 
and amygdala switch off so effectively without disturbing cognitions too much. Thank you so much. Yeah, I agree very much with you. Thank you. So time is rolling on. Do you have uh, time to keep um, answering? Because we have plenty of questions for you. Uh, yeah, I've got um, a small child who wants to be entertained, but um, I'm, I haven't heard from him. So Minecraft is obviously more interesting than this. So <laughs> let, let's carry on. That's, that's lucky for us. <laughs> yeah. So there's some questions in the Facebook chat and uh, one very simple one, maybe not so simple is, uh, how about ayahuasca? Like that's also a modality that people turn to. What do you think ayahuasca? about that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, ayahuasca is obviously um, DMT with uh, that's that's longer acting in an oral form, taken with the monoamine oxidase inhibitor, and it's a very promising compound. And um, there's a lot of a lot of um, observational research, and there's a lot of anecdotal evidence that suggests that ayahuasca is very positive. It's certainly a profound breakthrough experience. Um, it's been very difficult to study from a research capacity because um, most clinical drug research requires a clear, um, pure clinical drug. Um, and ayahuasca is a, is a very um, heterogeneous thing, depending on wh what you drink and where and, and who made it and all the rest of it. So it's been very difficult to study. Um, from a clinical perspective, but um, DMT, on the other hand, there's a lot of research now looking, there's a, a research project by a group called Small Pharma looking at DMT for treatment resistant depression. So again, the similarities between these drugs is greater than their differences. They all provide this opportunity for this peak experience, this non-ordinary experience, and that's what can push a patient forward out of their stuckness. So um, there's certainly going to, we're going to see more work with ayahuasca. Great. And one question I'm also interested in is uh, it's also from the Facebook chat. We, if you were to start from scratch and you wanted to <clears throat> get involved in the field of psychedelic therapy, do you have any ad advice like how to navigate this jungle? Okay, that's a good question. I mean, well, the first thing to say is this so-called psychedelic renaissance, um, great book, by the way, um, is... Uh, it's still only in its early stages and we don't know where it's going. And there's, there's still a very long way to go. Um, so don't despair. You know, I, um, there's also, what we're seeing that with this Renaissance is a massive connectivity and network of people who are interested. People talk about the psychedelic sixties. Um, you know, today is way more psychedelic than it ever was in the sixties. There's far, far more people using psychedelics clinically and recreationally than ever were in the 60s. And there's also far greater connectivity. Every single town has a psychedelic society. Um, if you don't have one in your town, then start one. Journal clubs, get together, meet on a regular basis, invite speakers, run conferences, set up conferences, write papers, write editorials. And eventually when you've got, when you can get the money to do this, do research, choose a topic, um, join an academic department and put forward a protocol for a piece of psychedelic research. The, the field is wide open. Every single aspect of, of mental health services um, can, can contribute. Psychedelics so beautifully span so many different disciplines from chemistry and botany to anthropology and law and politics and psychotherapy and psychopharmacology and you know so many different disparate um, disciplines meet in, with psychedelics. So whatever your interest is, pursue it and don't give up. God, I sound like a Californian guru lifestyle. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in the wrong job. Uh, uh, ben, uh, there's one question I really want to ask you. There's something also, we, we had this chance to meet uh, Rick Doblin in, in Berlin in, in the conference down there. And, and, and one thing I ask him, why isn't there more focus about the similarities about the dream state and psychedelics? Because uh, in, in, in like uh, Stan Groff's work, the, the, there's this idea that psychedelics are sort of um, amplifiers of the unconscious. Like if dreams are the right road to the unconscious, the psychedelics are the super highway to the unconscious. But basically it's, it's seen as the same processes of images and narratives coming up and maybe also this inner healing 
intelligence that Matt is talking about is also something that is modeled on, on dreams. Yeah. Well, what do we I mean, think I about think, that? I think dreams are far, far more complex and difficult to understand than psychedelics. Okay. Um, because the patient is awake during psychedelics and can talk to you about it. Um, so I think that studying psychedelics and using them as a clinical tool is far more valuable than dreams. Um, I mean, dream work is as old as psychoanalysis itself and, and has value as um, a springboard for um, encouraging a patient to free associate and talk about issues. Um, but the whole concept of dream analysis is very, is a very peculiar concept indeed. Yeah, I, I, um, I, I think there's far more to be far more interesting work to be done personally, I think, in psychedelics than there is in dream work. Yeah. But um, the, the reason why I ask is that as an integration therapist, I actually work with dreams where people come and they have a series of dreams, then they go to some underground therapist and have psychedelic experience and they come afterwards. And then I can see that sort of a sequence of the themes and the images going on in dreams the same images arising in the psychedelic experience and the psychedelic uh, experience being sort of processed in dreams afterwards. So it is actually, yeah. uh, it seems to be a kind of continuity if, if, if you want. Yeah, but, and uh, I think there is, and I think that there's, there's evidence from, from um, neuropsychiatric research that shows that. And, you know, Robin, Robin's work at Imperial, Robin Kaha Harris, um, with the um, default mode network, um, disengagement and the similarities between the dream states and the psychedelic states. Um, it is it is this um, increased entropy of brain and this mm -hmm. loosening of associations, which is similar to dreams and um, uh, psychedelics. I was just looking at another question from Helga. I think that's a great question. How do you address the stigma of working with MDMA and ketamine? She's, uh, Helga says, I don't tell people about my interests. Well, Helga, tell them, tell them. And if they misunderstand, just ask them to look at the data. Um, if, if they tell you that psychedelics are dangerous and unhelpful, just show them the data. It's as simple as that. Um, this, this awful, dreadful war on drugs that has poisoned the minds of people for the last 50 years um, is, is unethical and unpleasable and is killing young people and is politically shameful um, that people have this preconceived ideas about the harms of psychedelics, when in fact they're very, very safe and very, very useful. Um, you're going to meet stigma. Um, you just need to show people the data. If they know anything about clinical care, they the data speaks for itself. Um, and so I think that's the way to get past the stigma. It's just say, look at the data. If you really care about treating addictions, PTSD, et cetera, Look at look at this spectacular data, and 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 tell me this isn't worth looking at, you know. I'd like to follow up uh, this re actually really great answer with a question from the Facebook chat from uh, Laura, who says, "How do you think we could change the mind of family members who believe the old-fashioned way of addiction treatment is the most effective?" I'm really interested in psychedelics and treating addiction or mental diseases, but I feel like there is also a generation gap. Even the idea of the therapeutic use of psychedelics, they connect with drug addiction and see it as a bad thing. So yeah. she's talking about family members who are maybe not necessarily susceptible to clinical data and such. Uh, do you yeah. have any advice there? Well, you know, we could have this same conversation about vaccinations and COVID. It's like you you can you can form your own non-scientific, pseudo-informed opinions if you want, but I think listen to the experts who who study this all the time. And, and I think you're going to get a, a, get a clearer opinion. Um, now, I'm also not an anti-psychiatrist at all. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm certainly not um, in, in the field that sort of rubbishes all of psychiatry. I'm far from it. There's a great many people who benefit from SSRIs, benzodiazepines, antipsychotics. These are very useful compounds. The point is that psychedelics are another tool to use in, 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 our, in the future of psychiatry. So... Um, just be open-minded to new research, and and uh, it, it's very accessible these days. Yeah, very good. We have one question also from uh, Silas, who's asking, like in the chat, he's asking about sort of naturally occurring sources of psilocybin, mm -hmm. i.e., psilocybin cubensis. Do you see that there's a future in in kind of medicalized uh, psychedelic therapy with uh, natural compounds? Um. 
Uh, yeah, I mean, absolutely. When it comes to doing research, like I said before, in respect of ayahuasca, um, the, 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 the agencies that sanction research, they need to know that you're using a very, very close to 100% pure version of the compound you're studying. And so we, we use synthetic psilocybin um, because then we know that it's pure psilocybin without any additives. Um, now, of course, there may be benefit in the additives and there may be different experiences with pure mushrooms compared to synthetic psilocybin. I think personally, those are minuscule. And I think people who claim to tell, be able to tell the difference um, can't when they're, when they're actually put in a test situation. Um, but, you know, psilocybin and psilocin are predominantly the active components, but it's a bit like cannabis, you know, there's, there's far more going on than just CBD and THC. Um, there's all kinds of flavonoids and terpenes that, that give cannabis its flavor and its taste, but ultimately it really is down to THC and CBD levels. Um, so I think that whilst, when, it, when we're doing clinical research, it's very hard to do that with mushrooms because the agency in the UK, the MHRA will just say, what's, what's in the mushroom? And, and they say, you have to pinpoint the, the compound you're interested in. And then they, and when you say then psilocybin, they'll say, well, why don't you just make synthetic 100% pure psilocybin and study that? So yeah, um, who knows where that could go in the future though. It would certainly be much more accessible um, before the frosts come and uh, the picking is still going on. There are still mushrooms <laughs> growing in Wales. That's great. Excellent. Uh, maybe uh, Martin, maybe uh, we if there's a one question more from the chat, or maybe we should close off. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll take can... one more question. Is that all right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So the last question here is from uh, Katerina, also in the the net the network of mm -hmm. psychedelic therapists here. Um, how can we help people to connect and benefit from the support of each other after having been through individual psychedelic therapy? Will we see support and integration groups emerging to improve long-term outcome, maybe as part of the scientific investigation? Yeah, absolutely. Brilliant question. Totally. You know, the, the, the psychedelic therapy experience is just the beginning of the journey. It has to be integrated further. Um, integration groups, um, other, other kinds of cohesive community settings that bring people together, um, other kinds of therapies, Pilates, yoga, breath work, um, drumming, I dare to say, uh, um, raves, parties, you know, yes. this, it, it's all about, it's all about connectivity, you know, um, you, you don't have to, and nor do you need to stay high on these drugs forever. They, they provide a network of connectivity and it's really important that this is maintained. So I think post psychedelic course, um, groups are really important and that's a really good thing to, to start with going back to the question about how can people get involved um there's a lot of people out there who have had negative recreational psychedelic experiences um and are suffering and so forming a, a local integration group to talk about that um can be very valuable and very powerful excellent thank you so much do you want to round it off uh, anas and matthias yeah. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, uh, I can't see myself right now, but uh, <laughs> you're up there. Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, but but thank you so much, Ben, for a very inspiring talk, and I hope also that you inspire a lot of uh, future psychiatrists and uh, psychologists and, and psychotherapists to get involved in this field. And I'm also very, yeah, Matthias also. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I'm also very excited about this thing happening also in psychiatry because I've been, as a psychotherapist, I've been involved in, in the discussion about psychiatry for, for years. And, and I know that a lot of people are dissatisfied and, and think that it's, it's, it's only dampening the symptoms and not getting to the trauma. And, 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 and I would just love to see psychiatry be getting a more trauma focused more into going to the deep uh, underground tissue, as you said, uh, with the, some of this stuff. And then that could be re really fruitful uh, uh, ways to work together, like psychiatrists and, and the psychotherapists. Uh, that'd be an excellent thing. Now. So yeah. that's really what I'm hoping for. Well, and, well, thank you all very much for, for joining me this evening. And um, yeah, stay tuned. and dedicate your time and your lives to these because our patients deserve this um and uh
I'm really thank thankful to you all for listening tonight and for inviting me. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And then hopefully we will uh, see you in Norway. You're going to uh, have a, uh, a Yeah, I'm, I'm in Oslo in, in May. Yeah. Um, and then I'm not sure what, you know, invite no. me to Denmark. I'd love to come. Yeah, that would be great. And also see what uh, awakens, what their plans will be or your plans will be in, in, in Denmark. Also very exciting. And I know from our network in Denmark, we are a little group going to Oslo. <laughs> you know, we can take the boat from Denmark to Oslo and and have a nice party up there and, and, right. and meet us and do some uh, network in, in the Nordic countries. And, and cool. you will do a, a great lecture there. And uh, maybe we'll have a, a opportunity to to uh, to meet you there also or hear your lecture there. So thank you so much for, for this thank evening. It's been very inspiring. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.